Hello. Sorry, guys. I have no idea what's going on there. It worked now. We, we've lost. Is that okay? People. We've lost some people. Hopefully, they'll come back. But we've got some people. Yeah. Sorry, guys. I thought it was eight o'clock. I I'm getting very old. You know. It's yeah. uh, you know. It's, it's, my it's apologies. Nice. Well, here I am. Yes. Good. Good. What do you do with your dog if you're a very confused person who, who can't function in the modern world? Hello, Ziggy. Where's it? Oh, you're the best dog. Hello. Hello, Ziggy. You're good. good. <laughs> um, uh, I'm just putting another reminder out. Okay, so thank you for joining us, people who have joined us. Uh, I am Mick Wright, and that is Mike Wright. Uh, canine behaviorist. He's slightly with, confused. Better with dogs than he is with the technology. Um, <laughs> so, uh, the thing we we're going to start with this week was we were going to talk a bit about dogs and um, the benefit of having a dog if you're someone who's dealing with uh, trauma, say. And I thought it was it might be interesting to talk a bit about um, the work that you've done with veterans and dogs because uh, that's an interesting story. I think. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, I got involved with something called the, the Walnut Tree Health and Wellbeing, um, which is helping military veterans, um, people working in the police force and in the military that have um, experienced um, mental health trauma, if you like. So they, 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 have, they have mental health difficulties like PTSD, those, those, those types of things. Um, so talking with my better half, Sue, who's a specialist in mindfulness and mental resilience, she thought it might be a good idea to work together with people and with dogs. Um, so I do two things, really. One is something called poor support. Um, and the idea of that is I help a veteran find a dog, prefer well, not preferably, always from a rescue centre. I pair that um, dog up with the individual. And the idea is that the dogs are unconditional in, in, in their response to people. So they form a very good team. So they encourage people to get out and meet people and to talk and to resume a sort of a normal life that they haven't been doing before. Um, and I, 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 I do the same for, for for just normal people, and I, I call that canine companions, but it's the same sort of basis, help yeah. people find the right dog and help them develop and, a good relationship with said dog. And a, a big part of that is obviously, if you have a dog, dogs have a routine that they re, they have to do every day, and it's very helpful to people who maybe have slipped out of having a routine through, through being, you know, experiencing or dealing with a seriously traumatic, uh, experience having that routine is so helpful because the dog has that expectation of you to get up and walk the, the interesting thing is that um, a lot of these people that are suffering with with various issues a lot of them um, find it difficult to actually communicate with people and indeed go out and meet people in in, in a way that we accept as normal and is is no problem um, but having a dog forces them to actually leave their home and actually get back into the world a little bit. Um, and it encourages them to meet other people. And indeed, you know, when you've got a dog, people talk with you, particularly if they've got other dogs. So it's very, very helpful. Yeah, absolutely. Well, that's great. Um, fantastic. Um, where can people go if they want to read more about that? Because I mean, is, is this stuff online? Just visit, visit, visit my, my website. And that's called www.thecaninebehaviorist.co.uk and you'll find two different pages there. One's called Poor Support and the other one is called Canine Companions. Pretty much the same thing, slightly different target individuals. Cool. Okay, so um, I'm going to ask you about the first dog that you sort of encountered as a kid and what I'm hoping is that people in the comments will... Uh, tell us about their first dog or whether it's a dog that they had or a dog that they uh were you know able to encounter in one way or another so right tell us your story about that because jasper's a really interesting dog story well this is probably when i was no more than seven or eight maybe 
Jasper was our family dog. I use that term family in, in quotes because I, I'm convinced looking back on it, he, he had at least one home, maybe two homes, um, maybe even three. We were one of them. Um, so it wasn't a normal dog relationship. So Jasper would literally appear um, and he would stay with us for a month or so. Um, he, he wasn't a dog that you, you walk traditionally or anything like that. He'd go and walk with you, but we didn't use leads or anything like that. Um, and he would be kind of like a normal dog. And then he'd literally disappear for a month or two. Um, and he'd be seen, I, I, this is down in Somerset, where I was born in, in Taunton in Somerset, um, which is a market town. So he'd be seen in the market and he'd be seen around town. He'd be seen getting on buses and getting off buses again. Um, so, I, I, and then he'd appear maybe a couple of months later, smelling of silage or some other revolting thing. So we'd have to hose him down in the garden. Um, and he was like that the whole time we had him. In, in, in fact, I remember one incident with 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 uh, Jasper Is when the school the uh, never forget it. The school took us to yeah. see Cromwell. Yeah and the pictures and so we all got into our, uh, our bus um, from the, the secondary mom school I went to. We went into town and as we went into town Jasper saw me on said bus and he got on the bus and joined me upstairs to make his way to wherever we were going. Um, we got to the, the cinema to watch Cromwell um, and we shut him outside because really he couldn't come and watch Cromwell with us. Now of course Jasper had other ideas than that um, and somebody made a mistake of opening the door and in he came and he came upstairs to the circle and where he clambered across everybody to find me and sit down and watch Cromwell with me <laughs> at this point I was ejected from said cinema and I never did see Cromwell <laughs> well apparently it's very good apparently yeah, very good yeah. I believe it's on YouTube so yeah. okay, great well um and actually, we've got a good story. We've got a sort of much later in your timeline story about... Um, I'll tell this one, and then you can tell your part of it. So, okay. there's this rescue dog called um, Bert. And he was very smart dog. Very smart dog. And he used to revise for my exams with me in the garden. And he was very, very smart. And so, I, this must be when I was around, what, six... 15, 16, so sort of GCSE yeah. time. So, obviously, I'm at the age where my parents are going out and leaving me at home. And um, quite often, uh, the dog's getting out and he's just ward going off and doing things. And and my dad is regularly bollocking me for leaving the windows open. Just, like, me? sensibly. Yeah, yeah. My dad, that is you. It's I don't remember that. It's regularly bollocking <laughs> me for, for leaving the windows open. And I keep saying, I'm not leaving the windows open. Like, I did it. If I did it once, I wouldn't do it multiple times. Until eventually, we realised that we have windows that have uh, clutches that flip up like that. And Bert's really clever. Bert can open doors. Like if he wants to come in the door, just open it. Just gets up on his back and open and them the inwards. Yeah, and open them inwards. So it's qu was quite difficult because if you want to shut yourself in a room to do something, if he wants to come in, he's gonna come in, wreck the doors, whatever. But so we discover that actually, what's happening is Bert's opening these pushing the window open and, and going out and you and you just go and the the, the time you realized this was when does well when i closed all the windows and i knew i'd close all of the said windows and he still did it and i found him at the local ats having a cup of tea with the workers there as i drove by in my car looking for him um so um yes yeah Mike and, is you, spot and, you on there. The door and he just jumped in I said, have you finished? He, he jumped in and he, he came home again, yes. Yeah. The wonderful yeah. bird. Yeah, he was a very special dog. He was a very intelligent dog. I mean, I guess a thing that we could talk about a bit is, is, is people's misconceptions about dogs and intelligence because people m m make a lot of misconceptions about that. And I think that would be interesting if you want to talk about that a little bit. Intelligence. Well, here's, here's, here's the first um, thing that people need to understand. Uh, uh, one breed of dog isn't more intelligent than another breed of dog. It doesn't happen. So the people that have got their lovely colleagues, co um, border colleagues, and they say they're the most intelligent dogs, aren't they wonderful? Aren't they terribly clever? 
Mm, not really. They they are easier to train in certain aspects than other dogs. We we, we Mike will probably um, support me in this, uh, having got an ology. Um, we find it hard enough to to actually work out what our IQs are and what our intelligence is. So if you imagine a set of dogs, okay. At one end, you, let's say you've got a bloodhound, and then you've got 20 or 30 breeds right the way along, and at the other end, you've got your border collie. So, you're trying to measure how intelligent these dogs are from that side right the way through to here. So, you do some intelligence tests that are based on the border collie's intelligence. So, they're, they're herding, rounding up, and, you know, corralling sheep, that sort of thing. Brilliant at that, absolutely brilliant. And you try and do the same thing with the bloodhound, now he's as thick as a brick when it comes to that. He's the dumbest dog in the world. But if you then start to do a few intelligence tests that focus on the bloodhound skills, the ultimate sniffer dog, you'll find that the collie now is as thick as the bloodhound. So intelligence, most of the science would say that they're roughly of similar intelligence, but some dogs are better and easier to train for certain things than others if that makes sense I guess it would be, yeah I, mean, I guess it would be fair to say like even anecdotally that we had two dalmatians at the same time and hello ziggy which is a good girl you're okay oh you're just listening that's good that's good <laughs> so we had we had two we had two dalmatians at the same time and and they were I think it would be fair to say that Tess was probably, especially in her youth, a bit more a sharper dog in some respects than Barney in some ways. But also some Possibly. of that could be to do with personality mm. because he just had a more laid back personality as well. Mm. Yeah, I think um, you're probably right. I think the other thing, to, the, the other point to make about dogs in general, um, certain breeds have certain characteristics. Um, a, a Dalmatian is a good example because everybody thinks Dalmatians are scatty and are crazy and they're bouncing around all the time. Well, that's not really true either because most dog breeds, yes, they do have certain um, traits that are relatively common across the breed, but dogs reflect the homes that they live in. So if we're in a calm, relatively quiet home, You'd be surprised that your dogs are relatively calm and in fact these two dalmatians that mike talked about at home relatively calm dogs because they're living in a relatively calm environment That's most of the time spot. yeah there's definitely i mean we talked about this last week but there's definitely of all the dogs we've had they were the most food driven dogs i think definitely Definitely yeah, test uh, the female Dalmatian. We, we, we found nothing she wouldn't eat. Yeah, yeah. At all. And whereas, whereas, say, Ziggy, like, the Dalmatians, if they could get something off the table, they would take it. Yeah. Whereas Ziggy won't do that. But what Ziggy does do that the other dogs haven't done, or some of the other dogs didn't do, is she likes to, say, get a slipper and run around with it. Yes. Like, she likes to find a thing and run around with it. And some of the others yeah. didn't do that. So you do see these personality quirks well uh, the, yeah, the, the, the yeah the the the, the slippers and and the and the bringing of underwear into the house and the shaking of towels um i've touched on this before but that's an example of a dog not being naughty that's an example of a dog wanting some attention and wanting to to play so if if ziggy brings one of my slippers in she's wanting me to grab hold of the slipper so that then turns into let's play tug now yeah, if exactly, i don't but if i don't grab the said slipper she more often than not will lie down and just drop it or i'll go and yeah. sit with her and stroke her and not touch the slipper and she can't quite work that out because you're meant to be taking this from me so it, it, it's quite an interesting little phenomena yeah and, and and what you're saying there also is basically if anyone has that issue with a dog the, the, the best thing to do is to ignore it if they're not being destructive to it, you just ignore it because they get bored and they stop. Yeah, yeah, you're right there, mate. But here's here's what I would say: if 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 your dog has has got your favourite delicate um, silk scarf or a, 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 a lovely jumper or whatever it is, 
that is is dear to you and you don't want it damaged and your dog grabs it and you think there's any risk of of, of it being damaged and you want it back the thing to do is try ignoring her first of all and if it looks like the dog's going to go into the next mode which is having a bit of a tug and a pull and a pull holes into it well then you intervene and you hold the item while it's in the dog's mouth but what you don't do is you don't play tug with it so you hold the item yeah, on the mouth like that correct so as the dog pulls you just go with the dog so you you, you don't turn it into a game I, i'll often grab ziggy under the chin like that very gently i'm not hurting her just grab her very gently and i'll just hold on to it and we'll just sit there and we won't we won't yeah. we won't do anything and she will 99.9% of the time then still, oh well, I'll just let it go. And then she gets a lot of praise, what a good dog, and away you go. So, yeah. But if you turn yeah. it into a game, you've got no chance, you know. And don't ever go down the route of, oh well, it's all right if they've got an old slipper. You see a lot of people do that, and this is a bit old hat, I know, but got an old slipper, it's all right for them to destroy, that's fine. But here's the thing. Your dog doesn't know whether your brand new spanking beautiful leather slippers are for tearing and ripping up as opposed to the old tat yard one. So you've yeah, got to be very clear in the signal. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, they, 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 they can't. But also, the good thing to do is, is again, is, is like, well, Ziggy has a basket full of toys that are her toys. Yeah. She understands those those items are her things. And that's, yeah. that's good as well because that's, quite delineated yep. it's like here you have some things they're your things yeah these things aren't your things not that she can yeah, stick no, to that all the time but she sticks to it mm. pretty well yeah um does if anyone has a question and is in in the chat just stick your question in the chat and we will answer it otherwise we will just talk about more things because that's what we do but um twain says i've heard of cats behaving like jasper but dogs so well yeah yeah <laughs> definitely think, um, but then again yeah, you know, de definitely cat, yeah. Fat cat who lives near me, the cat, he's very dog like. So, you used mm. to, uh, people do see that in cats sometimes. You, you experience mm. these more dog like cats. So, yeah. Um, well, so, just, yeah. just to be fair, um, it's, it's, is it, how do I pronounce that? Is it Wenny? Is that Swain? Swain. 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 Sorry, sorry, Swain. Yeah. My apologies. Um, Jasper was quite unique, Swain. I've never come across a dog like that and mm. I, I haven't seen. Um, uh, he, he was very, very unusual, but, but yeah, c cats can often behave in a similar way to dogs and vice versa. Not, not highly I, common, I, but it happened. I, I wonder to a certain extent whether Jasper was a product of the sixties and seventies in the sense of it's a, the town, the town, there's more green space around the town then than there is now. Mm. And also mm. people's attitudes towards dogs. Like there were a lot of farm dogs, for instance, who would be yeah. left out in the yard to roam and stuff. Farmers still do that, but not so much. So I wonder whether we don't see as many dogs like Jasper anymore because the way we think about and treat dogs has changed quite a lot as well. Well, these days he'd be picked up and put in a, a pound. He'd be, he'd be picked yeah, up, he wouldn't be allowed saying. to be roaming around. The, the whole cultural thinking around dogs is so different, you know post yeah. the dangerous dogs act and all that kind of stuff um, yeah indeed so which is a t a quite a bad piece of legislation in, in, in any number of ways but um yeah yeah oh, i i i, I say again we could talk again. about that actually that's an interesting yeah topic. well it's Let's interesting I, that. I i i follow a lot of um various dog related pages and i i i, I do read some very distressing stories um I, I know for a fact that there's a guy that walks um, a pit bull in, in the park where I go. I know it's a pit bull, um, and it's a delightful creature, very, very friendly, very, you, you, you know, mild-mannered dog with everybody and other dogs. Um, certain breeds get very bad reputation. I mean, people think... Um, Bull terriers are aggressive and dangerous and, and and all the rest of it. When in fact they 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 are yet another one of the dogs that are called nanny dogs. They are beautiful mm. dogs with a fantastic nature, but in the wrong hands. Like any dog, actually, no matter what dog it is, a chihuahua can do you some damage. Um, mm. 
in, in, in the wrong hands, they become trophy animals and you can train them to fight. But here's the thing about a dog like a bull, bull terrier. Bull terriers, as a general rule, don't go looking for fights. They don't go looking for aggravation. But trust me, if you want to take it to them, they do not back down. You know, the phrase, yeah. do you want a piece of me? You say that to them and they will give you a piece of them. You know, so I think it's a, it, 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 it is a flawed piece of legislation. I think we do need to, to keep dogs under control. Um, but it needs looking at again, I suspect. I think it's applied very unevenly. Um, and, and some of the fundamental underlying assumptions in it are wrong. Like, because what you're just saying, like, the, no, the a lot of tabloid stuff around devil dogs and whatever was an app, it's just not the case. And what's, yeah. what's also true is, in, an, in a big city like London, um, you see a lot of dogs. I, I encounter people, I, don't, I keep my distance, but I've, I've seen plenty of people who have trained dogs to be fighting dogs. They, you yes, see them on a certain yes. type of lead, often a chain lead. You can tell that that dog has been trained to be aggressive. Yeah. And you can yeah. see it in them, but always in their shoulders. You know, they're really kind yeah. of forward yeah. and, and, and head forward. So I don't believe the Dangerous Dogs Act has done very much to prevent that. Because all that's happened yeah. is people who train uh, good dog owners aren't doing that, but are... are often face issues or can face issues on dangerous dogs mm. but the ones who are bad owners and who are gonna do that stuff they're doing it anyway so i don't mm. think it's made that much of a difference it's a very difficult problem I, I, if, if, if it was up to me i would take the dogs away from these individuals um and i would uh, readjust the dog's behavior so they can be returned into a proper into a proper home because it's possible to do that it's not easy but it's possible to do that um, yes, you're right. But of course, right. as you say, they'll just go and get another one. It, it's it's but, difficult. But the thing as well, as I think that for, and, and a lot of, some people may not agree with this, but I, I think that animal cruelty sentences are never strong enough. We should no. treat cruelty towards animals in the same way that we treat cruelty towards children. And the punishment yes. should be um, equal to that. So if you, if you well, to be fair, a, a dog, you should get a custodial sentence. Well, to be fair, Mike, the Animal Welfare Act allows for that, and it has some. You can get up to something like ten years, um, but it's never ever ah, yeah. applied. But it's, it's never applied. That's the point. Like, you're right. That's it's correct. In the yeah, it's never applied. It's not being I, applied. I, let, let me put it this: I'd make it even more simple. I don't want to get too political here. I'd, I'd rather answer the questions about dogs, but I'd, I, I'd make it very, very simple. If you abuse a dog or are cruel to a dog in any way, shape, or form and you're proven to do that, you should be banned from having dogs again, period. Not as it happens yeah, at I the moment. You'll, you'll, you'll have someone who's been breeding dogs in horrible conditions, and they've gone in and they, they found dead dogs, and whatever it is, they get banned for two or three years, and then they're allowed to do it again. Yeah, that no, makes I sense. agree. So, mm. taking a switch just to a more pleasant thing, which is so... Yeah. Which... Uh, we we believe like our family like one of the kind of core beliefs in our family and 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 something that you uh, stress a lot when you talk to other people is the best thing to do uh, if you want to get a dog and you're in the right place to get a dog and that's something we've talked about before and we don't really need to go over like what you need to have in your house to get a dog but if you're in the right position to get a dog you should get a rescue dog yes. the question i think is interesting is how do you when you're at the rescue center and you're seeing dogs like what is it for you personally that makes you go this is the dog that this is the right dog this is the dog that needs that needs to be in this family well uh, let me just roll that back a little bit mike just a little bit before i even get to the rescue center there's some important questions that have to be asked and answered before you even get to that stage so question number one is, what is your home environment? What is your life? And, 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 and yeah, what well, is your well, life well, like? What I'm saying is, right. yeah, hang on. we've covered so that stuff. Before you, do, before you go there, you answer those questions. Can you fit a dog into your life and give it what it requires? Yeah. Um, but then when you go, 
to be honest, um, I, I, I've, I've, we've rescued, I think Ziggy is our uh, fifth or sixth dog now, all rescued. I, I, Sue, um, Mike's um, mother and myself, we've never gone into a rescue centre looking for a specific dog or a specific breed or something that looks lovely. We've gone there with, with the premise and the only concern in our mind um, to give a dog a home. That's it. And it, it, it doesn't matter what it is. We, we, we've rescued two Dalmatians. We've rescued the lovely Ziggy because she needed a home. She came from a home that we, where she was abused, you, you know. And we just go in to look for a dog we think um, we can help. I, I'll, let me go back to Bert. Bert's a very good example. Oh, oh, oh. Hold on just one second before we get into Bert, and Bert is a great example. The, obviously, the one caveat that you've got, uh, that, that you do have in it is, um, you may have a lifestyle which is, which where um, having a small dog might be more suitable than having a big dog, for instance. So you're always going to have that, cr there are some yeah. criteria you might go in with. Um, yeah, yeah. You know, because you, you could have a lifestyle that does suit you having a dog, but a small dog might be better for you because big dogs just require... Well, for, 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 for example, Mike, if you live in a small um, flat, you don't want um, a St. Bernard. No, exactly. You, you know, so exactly. you're absolutely on the money there. You, it, 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 your home environment has to be right for whatever type of dog you end up going for. But, yeah, but exactly. I just would say, when, when you go to a rehoming centre, just be fairly flexible. You know? Yeah. And, and, and don't be put off by the attitude of some of them these days, a lot of rescue centres unfortunately seem to be more concerned with, with reasons not to allow you to rehome a dog than reasons to rehome a dog. That's where I think the behaviour stuff need, needs to come in a, a little bit more. So for instance, the, the amount of times I've, I've heard, no good with children, must be only dog, etc. That's done for the protection of the rehoming centre and to hopefully not bring yeah. dogs back. However, we're doing dogs a disservice by doing that. You, you, you know, if we work with them properly, the, most dogs you can bring into all sorts of environments with, with, with common sense and help. Yeah, 100%. So let's talk about Bert, because Bert, like you say, Bert's a good example. Well, Bert, let, let me just tell you first of all, my, how, how I came to have a dog first of all. OK, um, I, 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 as anybody here last week, I'm ex-Royal Navy, so I left, left the Navy in 1987 and I went into the medical world. I was on the road selling all sorts of medical equipment. And I used to drive, I live in um, Norfolk, and I used to drive past the Wood Green Animal Shelter and I'd, I'd always wanted a dog. And I went in there one day and I said, I really like a dog, but I've come in to look at some cats. Because cats were easier. I felt cats would be easy to look after, you know, because my yeah. wife and works. You've had works. Cats. And you've had yeah. cats as well. Yeah, yeah, no, I love, I love all animals, you know. Um, but I remember I was just leaving and I said to him, you know, yeah, I, I, I could easily take a couple of cats. I really love a dog, but hey, I'm on the road and, and, and I, 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 it, it's not fair enough. And at this time, they were euthanizing dogs, they couldn't keep them. The cats, they had thousands of them in there and th there was no problem looking after them. And they said to me, where do you think the dog would rather be? At home, sometimes alone for a few hours or on death row. Mm. Perfect salesmanship for me. You know, a few weeks later, yeah. we're at home with our first dog, Honey, that, that Michael remembers as well. Um, but Bert, mm. Bert was our second rescue. He was very interesting. Back in the 80s, I think it was the late 80s, there was a big foot and mouth outbreak. Um, so dogs weren't getting rehomed. They'd been in there a long time, a lot of these dogs. And Bert had been in the rescue centre for about six months. And he'd become totally... Yeah. This, was the 90, this was the 90s. This was the 90s. Sorry? This was the 90s. 90s. This was the foot and mouth outbreak in the 90s. Oh, yeah. well, that's it. Well, that, that's then. Well, yeah. So... I, I, I remember I went in there with, with Sue, my, 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 my better half, and we walked past his cage and, and there was Bert and he was in the back of the cage and he wasn't coming to anybody, but he came to us. 
there's your choice. There's your choice. Yes. As far as I was concerned, he, he needed a home and he was looking at us saying, come on, you'll do for me. So we took him home from there. Um, you, you know, so sometimes it's just like a gut, gut feeling. Little Ziggy here. The reason we got Ziggy is because Sue saw an advert in the paper for her and she wasn't even up for adoption. And we went to the rescue centre and um, she wasn't even on show. But here she is with us and she's been with us for five years now. You know, yeah. so yeah. to answer your question, Mike, it, it's, you, you have to have an overall view of what sort of dog you, you can manage if you like, but then it's sort of like in your gut a little bit. You know, well, you see, I basically it. knew what, you know, I basically, as I usually do on this, knew what the answer would be. And that's what I was kind of pushing for, which is, which is like, you've got to know about the instinct side of thing. Like if the dog is, part of it is once you've got all your checklist done in your head and you know, you know, the home is right. I'm ready to get a dog. I know what sort yeah. of size of dog I can cope with. Yeah. You, you meet the dog, you'll know. You will know yeah, with a rescue. There's a, there's well, a, there's if a Swain sense, gets you know, it, I just see your well. comment here, Swain. All dogs I've shared at home with have been rescued. Good on you. You get my vote. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, and I think the other thing is really important is is that, um, and we should talk about this bit, is that it's like you say, sometimes rescue centres can put you off somehow in ways because they're trying to protect their asses. But also, yeah. rescue dogs are not, well, the way I would say it is, is like it's like with children. You you can't ex do, you, you don't expect like toddlers to be easy, right? They're just not. They're just they. Th there's a lot of joy to be had with looking after a toddler, but they will also like smear their own shit on the wall, and like you've got to like yeah. cope with that to a certain extent. You know, things will happen that are difficult, and with rescue dogs, that's what people have really got to be aware of initially with a rescue dog you can have a very sharp learning curve and also all sorts of things can come out that you didn't realize the, do the dog had things that that ziggy for instance can be very head shy because probably yeah. someone's hit her at some point and there you are certain things that you've got to do with ziggy yeah you make that are, you wouldn't do with other dogs yeah you make a very valid point mike Here, here's the thing people think rescue dogs are harder than bringing a puppy into your life well trust me Puppies need specific care and a specific program. And trust me, they're, they're, they're no easier than a rescue dog. A rescue dog will bond to you very, very quickly. They really appreciate, in my humble view, in my experience. Um, my, my, my only other comment I would say is because I'm a behaviorist, but when you take a rescue dog, um, think very carefully about what you're bringing on board make sure that you get some good advice from the rescue center hopefully they should have a behaviorist if if the dog's got a, any issues because of course not every dog you bring into home is going to have issues some of them will some of them won't but if if you're prepared to take them on and put a bit of bit of work into them trust me the rewards you get will far outnumber and outweigh the effort you put into it yeah, and, and and the last thing you you mentioned mike um this bit about not not understanding the dog initially I, I i i compare it a little bit like peeling an onion you know and there's layers and when you have a rescue dog it might have um experienced all sorts of things that don't come to light until months after you've had the dog actually months you know i mean well, yeah, I, this, I, I, this that that is the thing isn't it because the thing is as well is that you've got to realize with a rescue dog is that you're bringing a rescue dog into a new environment and of course like christmas for instance is a really ex interesting example right yeah because suddenly there's like your behavior as humans that it's got used to um th there's all this new behavior because christmas is an unusual time of behavior and like yeah. presents and stuff where yeah. things that are wrapped up you know new smells yeah not that it's yeah. bad it can be really good dogs find it very exciting but it's a mm. new thing and you might see behavioral things you don't see in the day-to-day -day. no you're absolutely right mike you just have to keep you have to just pay attention to them because they're they're seeing things every day and some of these things might be brand new to them or they might be bringing up memories of either good things or more likely bad things that have happened to them in the past bert was a good example yeah. of that when we got bert home for the first time i I thought, I know, I'll play with Bert. So I, I, I got an, a, a, an empty kitchen roll, so just a cardboard. Go on, Bert, you know. And 
he shrank away from me. He hid under a table. He was petrified. I might as well have had a baseball bat in my hand. So you can probably surmise from that. He'd been in an environment where there was either um, family strife or strife in the household, or indeed he'd been hit. You know, so you just got to be prepared for some of the odd things that might crop up. Yeah, and he was never like huge with toys, really. Yeah. No, no. What's this? I've got a little bit here about Tara, character or female. I can see a bit of it. Can you see that? Oh, one? I can read it. I've got the whole thing. I've got, yes. Yeah. Well, it says, we were supposed to adopt Alfie's sister, but when we went to visit them, we realised that with Tara quite a, already quite a character or female, uh, we would be better to get a male dog. Also, he seemed a better fit when we met him. Yeah, exactly. Like, that's making yeah. the right calls, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, that's yeah, what was thinking about Bert, that, Bert that. Was... Say again, Mike. No, I was going to say, so say Bert wasn't a, very much a toy guy. He wasn't no. that into toys. But init but what he did get into was swimming, which initially he didn't. You, you yeah. had to encourage him into swimming. But once we got into it, he was like, he's like the most swimmingest dog that we've had, I think. I spend Dick most of my life there. getting dogs in water, Mike. In the summer months, I, I'm the Burke in the river playing with the dogs. I think getting dogs in water is a fantastic yeah. thing to do for them. Yeah. Nothing more yeah, joyful than seeing a dog like in the it, water. They really like it. Yeah. Yeah, and it also yeah. makes it super easy, um, really good in this hot weather that's coming up. If you've got a dog and you're near a good... A, a good safe bit of water yeah get your dog swimming get in there with them it's really good obviously yeah. with all the right caveats about making sure it's safe for yourself and the dog but you know yeah no you're oh, absolutely the right tip, the, the other tip i was going to mention with the hot weather which is something you do dad and you could probably jump off from this and say some other things is i i always say to people when i visit them and it's hot i you know get some water put it on the dog's head that it really helps because the evaporation cools them down um, yeah, a lot of people don't seem to know that, and it's a really good tip. Um, so maybe just say we'll maybe finish off today with just a few tips about dogs and the, and the hot weather and how you handle it, what you do to make it easier right. on Ziggy. Because I mean, Ziggy's a very right. heavily coated dog. Okay, well, I I I I I used to teach doggy first aid. I I'm an ex naval medic, so first aid and and heat heat exhaustion. Um, dogs suffer from it you've got to remember they're wearing fur coats so it's about it's still about 22 23 degrees out there today and here's ziggy right now ziggy if i got up and ran around she would do nothing better than delight to run around and play with me um whereupon she will suffer the effects of of heat badly and she could she she has been prone to go into almost like a, a, a fit um so here's, here's some general advice about hot weather. Rule number one, if, if you're going to take your dog out and it's going to be hot, you take them out very early before it gets hot, or you take them out very late when it's cooled down. Or if you are going to take them out and it's warm, depending on what type of dog you are, Ziggy, for instance, is very ha hairy. She's got multiple layered coats. So I'll take her up to the woods where there's a river. And the very first mm. thing I'll do is I'll get her in the water and she'll have 10, 15 minutes just swimming, enjoying herself, fetching balls, sticks or whatever. And I'll go in there with her. Then we'll walk along the river um, and then we'll go in again. And we'll do that, you know, for, for maybe half an hour. Um, she gets fantastic exercise, but she's kept cool. If you allow a dog to overheat, um, you, you, you can pretty end up with a, with a dead dog. I, 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 let me just tell you a few things that drive me insane with, 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 with people with dogs. Don't strap a dog to you and go running. Don't strap a dog to your bike and go cycling. They don't enjoy it. It's extremely stupid and it's extremely dangerous. We even now have a sport called canny cross. Now, canny cross is where runners, athletes, fit athletes, they strap a dog to their waist and they go running with them cross country. Therefore, canny cross. We well, don't and need it's a strap. wonderful you thing. Mean attach. You yeah. can attach or you can 
saying strap. It sounds like they're... attack. Yeah, attack to the yeah. 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 That's it. Yeah. That's it. And then they go running, and and they love it. Now, let me just be very clear. No, they don't love it. They're doing it because they're being forced to do it. So, if you're a runner and you want to run, great. Got no problem with it. You don't take your dog. If you're a cyclist and you want to cycle, great as well. You don't take your dog. If you're going to take your dog out, it's your dog's time and you walk with your dog. That's it. Okay? And, and you, you allow the dog to do what a dog should be doing. So that's stopping and sniffing, um, getting in the water, playing with other dogs, meeting other people, all those sorts of things. Um, you well, don't do it in combination with something else. Sorry, Mike. Going past the walking, going walking stuff's great, and we've we kind of got that, and that's good. Yeah. There are some other things that you do when it's hot with these. So there's some things like, you know, if you're lucky enough to have like a, have a garden and a, and, and a patio door, for instance, you always have the patio door open, but you have the curtains drawn. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Closed, so that yeah. you've got a cool room. There's a few. There's quite yeah. a few things that you do to help her. No, you're actually right. And, and, and also, if, if, if your dog is the one that likes water and will go in a paddling pool, get yourself a paddling pool. Now, yeah. I've got a big doggy paddling pool. I fill it up. Ziggy doesn't go in it unless I'm in it. Um, so I have to go in it with her. You, you know. Or during the day, I'll give her a bit of a hose down. I'll cool her down. Because yeah. actually giving her a bit of a drench in the garden with the hose... Um, you cool down by, by evaporation, okay? A well, human do the same to, thing. I, I you mentioned that say, earlier, yeah. Mike. No, no, I was about to say, because the, the science thing of that is dogs don't sweat, right? They just, they don't sweat. because They sweat the a little bit do. through their pores, but minuscule. Yeah, exactly. But, but physically, yeah. the rest of their body doesn't really sweat. So what you're no. doing when you you get a dog wet like that is it's it's doing... The sweating it's essentially giving them the effect of a sweating process with the with the evaporation yeah. well the evaporation cools doing. you down you see it cools you down yeah you're sweat helping sweat, them regulate their sweat. temperature yeah but that's the reason we have sweat is the sweat is there to partially to get stuff out mm. of us but also it evaporates and has a cooling effect that's so right. you're, well, yeah, you're right don't can't do that that's why they pant like demons when they're hot that's that's them yeah. trying to cool down um so yeah, you help them where, where you can that's a very yeah. inefficient uh, way of cooling down. Okay, well, that is good. Um, also, stuff you could do, like put ice cubes in their water if they like that, which some, some of them do. Well, um, Ziggy's been lying on the sofa with, with, with uh, an ice pack on th th this afternoon. We've got a very big ice pack. Yeah. So we freeze that, wrap it in, 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 a, in a towel so it doesn't hurt her, lay it on top yeah. of her, and she cools down and goes to sleep. Yeah, that's good. None of it's rocket science. Would, it's fairly just common I wish sense. I someone would do that for me today, to be honest. Yeah, indeed. Indeed. Yeah. So, um, we will remember, when I end this thing, I'm going to remember to save the video so we'll be able to share yeah. this so people can re-watch it. Um, yeah. Thank you very much, Swain, for publicising this on Twitter as you've done so well uh, the past couple of days. That was really helpful. Yeah, thank um, you, Swain. We will do the same again next week, same time. Dad will turn up yeah. on time this time because I'll remind him. Yeah, um, I will. Uh, what I'll do I'm, this... I'm, 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 I'm hanging my head in shame, really. Yeah. What I'll do this <laughs> week, and, and, and Dad, you can do this as well via your, um, via your Facebook page and wherever, is I'm going to solicit questions this week. So get people to, uh, anyone on, on now, if you know people who, who, who haven't been on the call but have got questions or you think, have got dogs that they should have questions about, maybe encourage them yeah. to watch next week. But we'll do a Q&A special next week, so I'll try and get as many questions as possible, and we'll just rapid fire go through the questions and, and see and see if we can answer a load of dog queries uh, next week. Yeah, excellent. <laughs> so 8 p.m. again, says Swain. Yes, okay, cheeky. Thank you. <laughs> Swain, you've seen my picture. I'm no spring chicken. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, 7 p.m. next week on Wednesday. Uh, brilliant. Thank you very much again, Dad, for uh, a, a good uh, a good show. And we will we will be back again next week. Excellent. All right, guys. Thanks Thank a lot. Thank you for tuning in, everyone. Bye. Bye-bye. Save it, Mike. Bye-bye. Um,